What would you do in a zombie apocalypse? For years, that was kind of a fun question to consider. It would be horrible, of course, but maybe also kind of zany, like zombie land. You and your survival companions could have a silly, goofy time. We've seen a lot of disaster media lately, whether it's dystopian or actual end of the world stuff. But obviously, since the pandemic, asking what would you do during the apocalypse isn't a silly rhetorical question. It's too real. It hits close to home. Many of us realized we are not prepared prepared for any sort of disaster. We don't have a safe haven. Wait, you don't have a doomsday bunker? Why don't you just buy one? Grab that spare 50k or a couple hundred thousand laying around and you can create the bunker of your dreams. Hello my dudes, welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis. Today's topic is doomsday bunkers for the rich. I've read some articles on this topic in recent years and I just find it so fascinating. I am a certified billionaire hater, so sometimes I just like to make fun of rich dorks. It's so cathartic. So let's explore some luxury bunkers and see what necessities the ultra-rich want to surround themselves with in case of disaster. Ooh, this company can build an ultra-luxury underground bunker next to your house. Oh yes, very convenient. Gotta make use of all that land and house I don't own. Their little humble option is the linear model. Two bed, three bath, 3,000 square feet. It starts at only 8 million. What a bargain. I hope it comes with a pool. Oh, of course. You can also add a garden, cinema, art gallery, gym, sauna, and staff quarters. Definitely, can't forget my staff. Sheridan, if the world ends, are we still gonna be writing videos? Next model is the Futurist, four bed, six bath, 5,700 square feet, 15 million. It's cute. Ugh, for a bunker, it's gonna be tight. But before we continue, this portion of today's video is sponsored by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a subscription that sends you a great new book every month. Their team reads hundreds of new releases and narrows it down to about five to seven for you to choose from. This can be a really fun way to discover authors or books you might not know of yet. Plus that curation can really cut down on decision fatigue. So you look through their monthly selections and each month you can pick either a hardcover or an audiobook. Book of the Month let me pick two books to share with you all. And of course, they arrived in the classic blue box. So I have Paper Names by Susie Law. An unexpected act of violence brings together a Chinese American family and a wealthy white lawyer in this propulsive and sweeping story of family, identity, and the American experience. And I have Did You Hear About Kitty Carr by Crystal Smith Paul, a multi-generational saga that traverses the glamour of old Hollywood and the seductive draw of modern day showbiz. For both authors, these are their debut novels, so that's very exciting. And they both happen to involve themes of like intergenerational families, race and identity, but through very different plots and contexts, so I'm very excited to read them. So if you'd like to try out Book of the Month, you can go to bookofthemonth.com, join and get your first book for just $5 with code FLOWERS. Personally, I'd recommend Model L'Héritage. It starts at 60 million, but hear me out. Five beds, seven baths, over 12,000 square feet. Let's watch this promo video. We can never predict or control what will happen in the world, but our first most powerful instinct is always the same, to protect the ones we love. It's raining, dramatic. They're driving their big Escalades into the secret bunker entrance. Wow, look at all of that underground. Okay, first thing, this garage with a huge obnoxious car collection. Is that a Tesla Cybertruck? Of course. Nathan pointed out this is literally a Bruce Wayne fantasy. And that begs the question, is the Batcave also a doomsday bunker? Oppidum creates underground living spaces that are highly secure and completely discreet. So then we have this marble vault entrance and some atrocious green screen work. With everything you need to relax and unwind and keep your mind and body in peak condition. This feels more like a movie trailer than a product promo video. Like it's definitely playing into the action fantasy. And this has to be geared toward rich men who just want an excuse to make a fancy man cave. We love a little men's only cigar and scotch moment. They look like they're having a wonderful time. Isn't this the end of the world? Actually, maybe they are just chilling. Oppidum recommends making use of these bunkers during peacetime. It offers new opportunities for meeting and entertaining clients and business associates, enjoying time with your family, and immersing yourself in your prized collections at your chosen place of residence. 
Makes sense. If you're going to be spending millions on this, you might as well get your money's worth. What if the apocalypse doesn't happen in your lifetime? That would be such a waste. Again, this isn't just a bunker. Think of it as an extension of your luxury lifestyle. You've worked hard over many years, taken risks, seized opportunities, made your vision a reality. Your reward is the means to acquire and curate all the beautiful, rare, and precious objects you desire. It's called treating yourself. You know, when you ask most people what they would save first in a fire, they say people, pets, important documents, photo albums. Well, they're clearly losers who have nothing valuable to collect. And they're dumb because they didn't already have a disaster-proof vault. By the way, the highlight of this art gallery footage is the shot focusing on this. Freedom is the possession of those with courage to defend it. As if that would be you guys? <laughs> Now you might be wondering, if this really is the end of the world, what's the point of protecting your art collection? What if all currency collapses? Will those pieces still hold value? And I'm not talking about the intrinsic creative value. Obviously the reason we're collecting art is as an investment. And I actually can't think of an answer to this question aside from the rich would want to maintain a sense of normalcy. Pretend like a disaster isn't happening. Therefore they must be surrounded by their toys, cars, art, and wine. One one of the things that amazed me about this website is how it kind of exposes the priorities of the rich. To protect the people we love and the objects we cherish is the most powerful human instinct. First, protect your life, and a close second, your precious collections. They constantly repeat how important their wealth and material items are, which is not surprising when you're marketing to this clientele. Imagine there are billions of people out in the world starving and dying, but at least you get the comfort of knowing you're safe in your sick-ass bunker. You find yourself in a magnificent space with soaring ceilings, opulent handcrafted glass chandeliers, and custom-made furniture. It's hard to believe you're deep under the ground surrounded by thick layers of reinforced concrete, especially when you catch the scent of fresh flowers from the inner garden. I love how they're trying to make being deep underground surrounded by reinforced concrete sound lovely. The goal is literally to be so far removed that you forget what you're escaping. Whatever is happening in the world outside, you can rest easy and live fully in times of tranquility and in times of unrest. I mean, I'm sure we would all love to be that delusional and disconnected during the apocalypse, but come on. Forget what's going on outside with the regular people, the great unwashed. The point of this bunker is that you can really block it out. You don't have to witness the suffering. Nobody can come knocking on your door begging for help. You've paid, no, you've earned the right to relax, potentially even enjoy this. I mean, the world might be ending, but that shouldn't mean you have to sacrifice anything. And that's the fascinating distinction for the average person. If we were just alive and with our loved ones, we'd probably be feeling very lucky. But having a luxury bunker is not just about survival. It's about maintaining a relaxed, opulent lifestyle, even while the world is burning. I realized I didn't mention anything about like the power generation and backups. It's boring to me, but also like, I don't know if this stuff works. <laughs> they really emphasize how pretty it looks and they say it's all very impressive, but also I'm fairly certain this entire video is just computer generated. Like, is this real? Do they even have a real location of this? Has, has one of these ever been built? <laughs> So honestly, when I first started exploring this topic, I thought this video might be funny. Like this classic bunker tour that looks like a rainforest cafe. It really feels like you're in your own private oasis. This is 15,000 square feet. It really doesn't feel like you're that much underground because like when you look at this carpet, like a tree, it's nice. Like they have like trees and stuff down here. Look at like the beautiful murals. Imagine if the world ended and you couldn't really go outside much because it was scary and there are things going on. This would be the place to be. Look at that. Ew. Ew. It's hard to believe you're deep under the ground surrounded by thick layers of reinforced concrete. That is concrete above that. Yeah. Yeah, some of that is funny, but as I wrote this, it got dark. Naturally thinking about the apocalypse or climate disasters, the end of the world, is not nice. But this idea is actually infuriating. The super rich are the ones actively destroying the environment and the world, yet they can afford to just outrun the problems and disasters they're causing. Here's a quote from this Douglas Rushkoff piece, which was a big inspiration for this video. More than anything, the rich have succumbed to a mindset where winning means earning enough money to insulate themselves from 
from the damage they're creating by earning money in that way. The ordinary state of capitalism is a disaster for 99% of us, but it's great for them. And on top of the usual mess, there's disaster capitalism. Essentially, when investors and companies descend, ready to exploit disasters and make huge profits. A housing or stock market crash? Prime opportunity to buy low. Food or supply shortages? Huge demand means price hikes. Take COVID, for example. While most of us were struggling just to stay healthy and alive, the super rich were living in a different reality. At worst, they were stuck quarantining in their massive mansions. But many could simply escape the pandemic by flying away to their secluded properties. And honestly, COVID was an opportunity for them to earn more money than ever. According to this Brookings report that examined how 22 corporations handled the pandemic, overwhelmingly, financial gains benefited wealthy shareholders and executives, while frontline workers experienced the greatest losses and benefited minimally from company success. Their shareholders grew $1.5 trillion richer, while workers got less than 2% of that benefit. And even after any small increases, the vast majority of these companies still don't pay most of their workers a living wage. And from the Washington Post, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, and six other tech titans made more than $360 billion during the pandemic. It really just twists the knife. Not only do these billionaires get to escape reality, but on top of that, they continuously exploit their workers and reap huge profits from everyone else's suffering. Now let's talk about doomsday preppers in general. I couldn't possibly make this video without acknowledging how differently billionaire preppers are viewed compared to others. First of all, it's wild that most people in the US can barely afford housing, like one primary residence to begin with, let alone paying $50,000 or more to get a small studio-sized bunker. So having one is like unthinkable for most people. Meanwhile, the ultra rich can afford not only one bunker, but potentially multiple locations around the world. Typically, preppers have been seen as kooks and conspiracy theorists. Now, those segments of people do exist who believe in certain conspiracies and are even potentially excited by the thought of an impending apocalypse. But I think it's important to note that there are some class distinctions at play as usual. Often when we think of doomsday preppers, we think of people living in a rural place out in the country. They might have military experience or a love of weapons. They stockpile canned food and supplies. They run drills and practice their plans, decked out in camo. And we laugh. The mainstream audience laughs. We think they're crazy. But really, preparing for disaster? It's not crazy. Here in the US, for example, we have lots of natural disasters every year. What's wrong with trying to prepare, trying to make sure you have a plan in place? Obviously, I could write a whole video about preppers. There's so much to say, but basically my point here is preppers have been historically linked to right-wing ideologies or Christians warning about the rapture. And again, those segments of people certainly still exist, but there are also left-wing preppers and the movement is not entirely white, even though mainstream depictions of preppers are white. There are growing numbers of BIPOC preppers. But regardless, it is not delusional to want to have food and supplies in case shit hits the fan. Again, here in the US, sometimes it feels like we're just like one day away from that at all times. But anyway, my point is that there is this stereotype that preppers are crazy poor country folk. Yet when billionaires have these intense custom bunkers, that's cool, luxurious, and common sense. It's the ever-present issue of classy if you're rich, trashy if you're poor. So yeah, I think there's a distinction between being a survivalist. Your goal is to survive, to protect your loved ones. It's not gonna be easy or pretty, but hopefully you can stay alive. For preppers, life before and after the disaster will look very different, and they know that. But for these billionaire preppers with luxury compounds, they're trying to make life after disaster seem as same and normal as possible. The fact that the world could be going through a horrific event and you could just be chilling. The privilege that you don't have to face that at all. So to me, it's a distinction between a survivalist and just a an elitist exclusionary fantasy. The importance of community. On that note, there is at least one big potential flaw in the billionaire's plan to live their blissful bunker life. 
Going back to that article by Douglas Rushkoff, this is a really fascinating story. In this piece, he describes how he was invited to address a group mysteriously described as ultra-wealthy stakeholders out in the middle of the desert. He was brought to this secret location expecting to do a talk about the future of technology, but instead he's seated at a table with these five unnamed super rich guys, at least two of which were billionaires, and they start asking him questions. They started out innocuously and predictably enough, Bitcoin or Ethereum, virtual reality or augmented reality. Eventually, they edged into their real topic of concern, New Zealand or Alaska. Which region would be less affected by the coming climate crisis? It only got worse from there. Which was the greater threat? Global warming or biological warfare? Finally, the CEO of a brokerage house asked, how do I maintain authority over my security force after the event? This is what they really needed help with. When a massive disaster strikes and the world is pretty much ending, will your staff remain loyal? Quote, they knew armed guards would be required to protect their compounds from raiders as well as angry mobs. One had already secured a dozen Navy SEALs to make their way to his compound if he gave them the right cue. First of all, imagine the privilege of having professional security guards and staff during a major crisis. But really, what would work be like for the staff. They'd have staff living quarters, but I assume the rich wouldn't let them hang out in like the cinema or the pools or the gardens during their time off. You're not part of the family, you're the help. And therefore you're expected to be as silent and invisible as possible. By signing a contract like this before a disaster scenario, the deal is you get to be alive. You're trading your labor for some level of protection and resources like food. That's better than being in the disaster. Probably. But this could also be a nightmare for the staff. Your entire existence would be to serve your boss. You can't have a life beyond that. You can't leave the bunker or the compound. The rich dude's questions continued. How would we pay the guards once even crypto is worthless? What would stop the guards from eventually choosing their own leader? The billionaires considered using special combination locks on the food supply that only they knew. Or making guards wear disciplinary collars of some kind in return for their survival. Or maybe building robots to serve as guards and workers, if that technology could be developed in time. This is absolutely wild. Like the disciplinary collars? That really got me. There's a glaring sense of dehumanization here. The staff are only tools for their boss's comfort and survival. These rich guys do not see their staff as people. If you aren't kind, compassionate, and generous to your staff, especially during a disaster scenario, why would they remain loyal to you? I guess only under the threat of violence or starvation. Rushkoff wrote about kind of that sense of wanting to be isolated from the regular people. They were preparing for a digital future that had less to do with making the world a better place than it did with transcending the human condition altogether. Their extreme wealth and privilege served only to make them obsessed with insulating themselves from the very real and present danger of climate change, rising sea levels, mass migrations, global pandemics, nativist panic, and resource depletion. For them, the future of technology is about only one thing, escape from the rest of us. So anyway, final thoughts. Things are looking grim. According to this article by Bradley L. Garrett, there have been massive increases in bunker sales, even for people who aren't super rich. And a 2012 National Geographic survey found that 40% of Americans believed that stocking up on supplies or building a bomb shelter was a wiser investment than saving for retirement. Now, as tempting as it may sound to buy a bunker if you could afford it, that is a very individualistic approach. Protect yourself and maybe a few other people. Lock everyone else out. If things go bad, we can only fend for ourselves. Now, that being said, I do believe that disaster preparedness is crucial. Ideally, our governments would be doing this work, ensuring that there are plans and supplies in place for any number of different disasters that could strike. But as we experienced throughout the pandemic, many of those plans didn't work or didn't really exist. And same goes for the supplies. Bottom line, governments were not adequately prepared. And in general, even during the best of times, the government still fails to protect and take care of a lot of people, especially the most marginalized. That's why so many have lost their faith in being protected. Nobody's gonna come save you. Hence why people feel the need to prep. Now, of course, as individual households, I think we all should have basic survival kits in case of emergencies. But overall, this is why we need to rely on each other. 
We need community. Surviving, especially during tough times, takes a village. Cue spoilers for The Last of Us. That commune looked fantastic. To end with another quote from Bradley Garrett, this practical deliberateness is where the preparedness movement is now headed. Aligning realistic fears about the future with practices of self-sufficiency, sustainability, self-care, and community building forms the foundation for what some are now calling doomer optimism. I'm just saying it doesn't hurt to get to know your neighbors, to get involved in your community, and maybe try to learn some practical skills like first aid, gardening, cooking, sewing, crafting. You never know when those might come in handy. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode despite the potentially extremely depressing subject matter. And thanks again to Book of the Month. You can go to bookofthemonth.com and use code flowers to get your first book for only $5. And now I've got to give a shout out to all my patrons. If you want to support my channel, check out my Patreon. I've got some bonus content there, videos, live streams. Extra thank yous to my executive producer tier. We have Uwu Face, Abby Hayden, Chloe Noel, Freshly Laundered, Ivy Adam, Jackie King, Jeanette, Jill Hoffman, Julie Leva, Matthew Gray, Megan Collins, MedCat33, Nicole Louise, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, Tom Walker, Treffa, and VivianOladon.com. Thank you so much for being patrons. Stay tuned for future internet analysis videos. Okay, thanks. Bye.